there's a there's a few reasons to do this. And specifically, I'm interested in immunotherapies and why these haven't worked in pancreatic cancer. But more generally, there's also a few other reasons to look at PDAC specifically. Uh, one of which is that it has a very poor survival rate of around 10%. Uh, immunotherapies that have worked really well in some cancer types, uh, like lung cancer, just haven't really worked over the standard of care in clinical trials in PDAC. And the reason for why this is the case is still a mystery, though there's a few hypotheses, including just a very complex tumor microenvironment that includes senescent and exhausted CD8 T cells that have been detected. Uh, but what I'm really interested in is things that the tumor can do to evade the immune system. So this is a loss of antigen presentation, and then how this interacts with the surrounding tumor microenvironment. Uh, now, just a bit of background. Uh, peptides from the inside of the cell are presented to the outside of the cell uh, through the major histocompatibility complex shown in pink here. Uh, this is a protein complex um, that displays a peptide uh, that's derived from the intracellular proteins uh, to the immune system. Now, if that peptide is either comes from a virus or is mutated in cancer, then activated T cells can recognize uh, this cell as a virally infected cell or as a cancer cell and essentially kill it. Um, and so this establishes an evolutionary pressure for cancer to, to evade these type of attacks. Uh, one very common way of doing this is to upregulate pd one uh, which is essentially um, causes an exhausted phenotype in the T cells, so they stop being able to attack the tumor in the ways they used to, and so then the cancer can proliferate more, more readily. Um, important for my project is are the HLA genes, uh, which encode the major histocompatibility complex in humans. Um, and so there's three genes of these with two alleles each, so six total genes. And so if cancers go through a loss of heterozygosity, so if one of the set of copies is lost, all of a sudden there's only three alleles left, or sorry, three genes left, and then uh, there's two things that happen. One, in theory, you get a lower dosage because there's less genes there to be expressed, but also these are the most diverse genes in the human genome, and so you remove certain alleles. And the reason this is important is because different alleles have different specificities for different antigens. And so if I remove a specific allele, some antigens may no longer be presented to the immune system. Uh, now this is, on the y-axis, you have a measure of uh, sequence diversity across the human population. On the y-axis, on the x-axis, sorry, you have the, uh, the position along the genome. And so as you can see here, the, the HLA genes are some of the most diverse genes in the human genome with the three class one genes comprising 25,000 known alleles. Um, so all of this together uh, really summarizes the need for advanced computational methods to understand uh, the, the set of LOSA. Now, luckily, I'm not the first here. There's been a few, uh, quite a few studies before me uh, that have looked at this. And so to identify a loss of heterozygosity at these genes, there's two steps that are required. One of them is the genotyping of the alleles uh, from a normal sample. And then that way I have a personalized genome just for this region for each and every patient. And then if I use a second tool called Lola to align reads from my matched normal and the tumor sample to the personalized HLA genomes uh, that I found with OptiType, uh, I can then compare the number of reads that align to each allele in the normal and the tumor to get summary statistics to identify these events. So for example, uh, if I compare the number of reads that align to both of the alleles of the same gene in the tumor, uh, I can get calculated B allele frequency, right? So if one of the two genes is lost, as shown here, then I will get a B allele frequency closer to zero or one, uh, and then I can identify this as a loss. Um, if the allele is intact, then I get expect the same number of reads coming from both of the alleles, and so the B allele frequency will be about 0 0.5. Uh, I can also compare the number of reads that align to the tumor and the normal, uh, and this is essentially shown in the log R value here. And if this log R value is around zero, then I have the same number of reads coming from normal and tumor. Uh, but if this is negative, then it's indicative of a loss in the tumor. And so that's the other way of, of identifying these events. Now I've gone through and done this for about 600 patients from both uh, uh, the PANQRX cohort here in Toronto, as well as TCGA. Uh, and overall, the proportion is around 26%. But when I account for tumor purity, this is a confining factor. Uh, I end up with a, uh, a percentage of closer to 30%. So this happens in about 30% of pancreatic cancer patients. Uh, now, because we have matched RNA samples from all of these um, patients, I've also started building classifiers to try and identify these events uh, just from the transcriptome. And so when I do this on a, a PANQ cohort, this works really well. So this is a ROC-AUC curve uh, showing the false and true positive rates. 
uh, with the perfect classifier having an area under the curve of one and uh, that sort of random classifier having an area under the curve of zero. So this works quite well, as you can see. And then I've also benchmarked this in, a, in TCGA, which uh, were samples that were never seen by the classifiers. This is completely external cohort. Oops, and the curve is somehow not showing, uh, but it's got a AOC of 0 0.77. So this works shockingly well in, in uh, my opinion, especially considering the shift of the main and that the sample quality in TCGA is actually not that good. Um, so now what I really want to do is to do this in single cells, but this is even more complicated because not only are the genes just as polymorphic, but we also have dropout and single cell sequencing. Uh, and so the way I've gone about this is to essentially take my bulk sequencing data, use the labels I've derived, and then train the classifier I showed in the, in the last step, and out they get a probability of LOH. Uh, and so I've trained this in such a way that I can also put my, take my single cell data and push this through the same classifier, and then I get a predicted probability of whether or not that single cell has gone through an HLA LOH event. And so that's what you see here. So each point is a cell uh, showing the probability of an LOH event in that particular cell uh, on the y-axis. And this is grouped by patients. So you can see quite a uh, range of probabilities. Uh, now, while I don't have ground truth data in single cell data, I can calculate the BLEO frequency across all of chromosome six, which is where the HLA genes lie. And so if I look at that, I see a BLEO frequency that is much higher for any cell predicted to be intact uh, compared to any cell predicted to be lost. Uh, and so this gives me great confidence that this actually works and this replicates across uh, through two different cohorts now. Um, so where do I want to go with this and why does this matter? Um, in PDAC, it turns out that HLA LOH events are early events. And one possible explanation for this is that samples that don't undergo HLA LOH never have an active immune response from the beginning. And so there's no selective pressure for these events to fixate in, across the tumor population. And so if that is the case, we would expect a um, a, a phenotype in the, the immune system that is unactivated in samples without LOH, while we would expect an activated or exhausted phenotype in, um, in samples that have undergone LOH. And that's exactly what I set out to uh, try and test uh, with these predictions. So specifically what I've done is I've taken the um, probability of HLA LOH in each individual cell for each patient. I then average these probabilities. So I get a mean probability of HLA-LOH for each individual patient. And then I take uh, any population of cells. So in this particular case, I took T cells, but I've done this for all other compartments as well. And then I essentially did a differential expression analysis for samples with high average HLA-LOH probability versus low HLA-LOH probability. And so if I look at the T cells for this, um, this is the volcano plot. And so the, the, the genes highlighted are mostly related to T cell activation and or exhaustion. And so as you can tell, most of these are upregulated. Uh, the uh, the p-values are a little bad just because uh, I only have a few samples. And so I'm currently working on replicating this with another cohort. Um, but if I also look at the um, enrichment score for these set of genes, I see uh, a, a positive enrichment, meaning that I have more activated or more exhausted phenotypes in T cells from patients that are predicted to be to have undergone HLA LOH events. And so future work, the goal of future work is to extend this across several other cohorts and then to redo this across all the other uh, cell type compartments so that we can figure out what effect HLA LOH has on, on the surrounding tumor microenvironment. And so I'll stop there and I'll just thank my lab, in particular Chengjin and Tiak, who've uh, helped me process some of these data, all of our collaborators, my committee, and our funding sources. And I'd be happy to take any questions.